This is part one of chapter two of analysis of time series on time series, models, trend, and autocovariance. And in this segment, we're going to introduce some general notation for time series data and models. And we're going to discuss estimation of trend, very fundamental time series problem. Um, and we're going to uh, revisit autocovariance and autocorrelation a, with um, a little more detail than in chapter one. Okay, so uh, a time series is a sequence of numbers called data. We're going to now use a star to denote data. So they're gonna be n numbers, y1 star through yn star, collected at an increasing sequence of times, t1 through tn. Now we're gonna write one colon n for the sequence one to n, which gives a compact notation rather than having to write y n star n is one through n, we're just gonna write y n star one to n with a subscript one colon n. Okay, so that's the data. A time series model is a collection of jointly defined random variables y1, y2 through y n, which using the same compact notation, we write as big y one through n. And like all jointly defined random variables, the distribution of y1 to n is defined by a joint density function, assuming it exists, we'll suppose it does. And we write this as f y1 to n of little y1 through little y n, given a parameter theta. Now the density is defined for arbitrary outcomes y1 through n, and uh, we're Sometimes we're particularly interested in its value at the data y star, and that has a special name, it's called the likelihood. We've set up some very general notation, which will give us a lot of flexibility in how we specify our models. So we write f subscript y for the density of y, evaluated at little y, f y z then, is the joint density of the pair of random variables yz. And we can write things like f sub y given z, the conditional density of y given z, is typically gonna be evaluated at matching little letters, y given little y given little z, but we could evaluate it anywhere we wanted. Now, we're generally gonna write things in terms of densities. If you have discrete data such as count data and introductory probability course will tell you that you don't have densities, you have probability mass functions. And then um, expectations of probabilities are integrals for continuous models against densities. They're sums against probability mass functions for discrete models. Otherwise, everything remains the same and we'll only write formulas for the continuous case and um, we would have to swap integrals for sums when working with discrete models, but hopefully you can um, do that yourself if you need to. Okay, so we have data and we have a model. Scientifically, we postulate that the data is a realization of random variables drawn from the model for some unknown value of theta. And we're interested in what ranges of theta are reasonable and whether the model itself is reasonable. You'll notice that our notation distinguishes between the model, which is the random variable capital Y1 to N, an arbitrary realization from the model, um, little y, and the specific data, uh, Y star. You can get a long way without making this distinction, and um, time series texts often don't. Shumway and Stouffer call all these quantities little y t, we're keeping t for continuous time. Um, but when you, when you try to um, understand things at, at, a, um, at a careful level, as we hope to in this course, it's helpful to give these things different names. So when we want to, we can talk about which one we're talking about. Some review on random variables. I'm not going to, in fact, review this, but I want to just check we're all on the same page. There are different answers to these questions, depending on whether you've taken an undergrad course in probability or a master's level or a PhD level, these um, definitions will be a little bit different. I'm, I just want to check that you have at your fingertips some working definitions of what is a random variable, what is a collection of jointly defined random variables, 
What's a probability density function, a joint density function, a conditional density function? What does it mean to say theta is a vector of parameters? Uh, okay. A uh, related quantity expectation, random variables usually have an expected value. In this course, uh, they always do. We will write a blackboard bold expected X for the expected value of a random variable X. And you should know what is expected value, how is it defined? And although in this course it will always exist, just for kind of background understanding, it's, it's good to think about how it can fail to exist so you understand the assumption that you're making, even a properly defined random variable can exist and yet its expectation doesn't exist. Okay, we're now in a position to define the mean function and we're going to use trend as a synonym for mean function. So the mean function mu n is the expected value of y n, which in the usual integral formula for expectation is the integral of y n f y n d y n. Um, it's a mean function or trend are the same thing and it's a function because it's a function of n. It's a function on a discrete space in this case. Uh, sometimes it makes sense to think of time as continuous and then you can write mu of t for the expected value of an observation at time t since you only make observations at the discrete collection of times t1 to n we write mu of tn is mu n. Now this notation uh, allows us to have arbitrary measurement times often time series have measurements evenly spaced in time Particularly in the second half of the course, we'll be looking at methods that don't require that. And so we'll want to be able to talk about unequally spaced observations or missing values. Um, okay, so mu n, the trend, may depend on theta, the parameter vector. In that case, we write mu n of theta when we want to make it explicit. Sometimes we won't write the theta, we'll just know that it's there. We don't know the trend, it's part of the model, not part of the data. So we write mu n hat of y to be some estimator of mu n. An estimator is a map or just, a, you could say a function, which applied to the data gives an estimate of mu n. Uh, an appropriate choice of mu n hat will depend on the data and the model. Here, when we write mu n hat of y, uh, we're distinguishing between an estimator, which is a function that can be applied to any data set, and an estimate, which is an estimator evaluated on our own data. Um, for thinking about model misspecification, diagnosing model misspecification, it's helpful to bear the differences in mind. We're going to do something with that quite soon. Okay, so the estimated mean function, or equivalently the estimated trend, is the value of the estimator applied to our data. And we're going to write mu n hat. If we, if we don't give it an argument, the, the argument is going to be the data. And so mu n hat is an estimate. Mu n hat of y is an estimator. And that's a small abuse of notation, but I think uh, one we can live with. One basic example, suppose that mu n is in fact not a function of n, mu n is a constant mu. Uh, in that case, the model is called mean stationary and one natural estimator of mu is the mean estimator. Mu hat of y is the average of the y's and mu hat is the sample mean of the data. Now we can compute the sample mean mu hat for any data set. Um, this is almost obvious, but it's also, it gets to be subtle. You don't need to have a reasonable model. You don't have to have any model to construct the sample average. It's still a, a quantity and you can talk about it. Um, so whereas Trend is a property of the model. Estimated trend is a function of the data, which only really estimates the trend if the trend model is reasonable. Um, so 
similarly, we want to, when we're trying to be careful with words, data can't be mean stationary. Only a model can be mean stationary. Stationarity is a property of models. So let's think through this question. Uh, properties of models versus properties of data. Consider these two statements. Does it matter which we use? One is the data look mean stationary. Two is a mean stationary model looks appropriate for these data. There, um, let's say um, these are similar statements. Um, two is more correct. Um, um, it acknowledges that um, mean stationarity is a property of the model. Um, let's say the difference may not be important. But um, it is better to be correct. And sometimes clear thinking um, does help with data analysis. Okay, now we're going to define the autocovariance function. Assuming that variances and covariances exist for the random variables in the model, we can write gamma mn as the covariance of ym with yn, which is the expected value of the products of the difference from average. And that's the autocovariance function because it's a covariance function between lags of y and itself. And it's a function of m and n. We can put all these uh, quantities in an n by n matrix, which we'll often call capital gamma, with the mn entry being gamma mn. One thing that can happen is that sometimes the covariance between two observations will depend only on their time difference. And in that case, the time series is said to be covariance stationary. And then the autocovariance function is a function only of lag h. So we can write gamma h is gamma n n plus h, where in equation five, uh, it doesn't depend on n. So you can just write it as a gamma of h. If you have a covariance stationary model and some mean estimate mu n hat, you have a natural estimate for gamma h, which is the sample autocovariance function. It's the, um, the classical estimator of covariance evaluated at all the pairs of observations separated by lag h. Um, it's in fact almost the classical estimator. Um, as we pointed out in chapter one, um, um, it's one over n, not one over n minus h or one over n minus h minus one um, for, for reasons that um, may pop up later in the course. Now we know that variance is often hard to interpret. We often rescale to correlation to get a more interpretable quantity. So that motivates us to define the autocorrelation function where you divide through by the, um, you divide through by, I guess, the square root of the product of the variances. But if it's covariance stationary, then the variances are the same. And they're, in fact, just estimated by gamma 0. So the natural um, definition of the autocorrelation function is rho h is gamma h over gamma 0. 
and we can have a corresponding estimator rho h hat is gamma h hat over gamma h zero and if we evaluate that at the data we get the um, sample autocorrelation um, estimate rho hat h gamma hat h over gamma hat zero. Now we now have um, four quantities, all of which are quite often called the ACF, the autocorrelation, the sample autocorrelation, the autocovariance, the sample autocovariance. When you use the acronym ACF, it's a really good idea to define it to remove this ambiguity. Oftentimes it's clear from context what people are talking about, but when it isn't clear, if you call them all the same thing, then it adds to confusion. Okay, this is um, reiterating a point that I made earlier. Sample statistics exist without a model. The sample autocorrelation and sample autocovariance are statistics computed from the data. You can compute them even when the data are not well modeled as covariance stationary. What does it mean to compute them is something that, it, and why would you compute them is something you can think about. But one thing you mustn't do in that case is you mustn't view them as estimators of the autocorrelation and autocovariance functions because they don't exist unless the um, process is covariance stationary. They're not defined. Also, if you want to be extra careful, you should not talk about the correlation or covariance of data. Those are properties of models. You have to talk about the sample autocorrelation or sample autocovariance of data. And sometimes that difference is um, worth bearing in mind. Okay, we will keep going uh, in the next segment. <laughs>